Hi, Miss Hernandez here. So today I'm outside doing my videos. Hopefully the background noise isn't too loud, but I wanted to enjoy some time outside today and try to do work while I'm out here because um, it puts me in a good mood. So we're gonna continue in our novel, Island of the Blue Dolphins, and we're gonna be in chapter 21 today. So I'm really excited to see what happens. Remember the Aleuts are back and we're gonna see what's gonna happen with that. So let's get into it. Chapter 21. I did not take Rontu with me when I left the cave that night, and I closed the opening so that he would not follow me, for if the Aleuts had brought their dogs, he would surely smell them out. I went quickly through the brush to the headland. Before I had climbed to the top of the high rock, I could see the glow of the Aleut fires. They had camped on the mesa, at the place and the spring they had used before. It was less than a half a league from my cave. I stood for a long time watching the fires, wondering if I should move to another part of the island, perhaps to the cave where the wild dogs had lived. I was not afraid that the men would discover me, because they worked on the beach or hunted in their canoes all day. It was the girl I was afraid of. The ravine was tangled with brush, which was hard to walk through, but in the ravine grew seeds and roots. Some... Okay, so on this page, Karana talks about being worried that the girl Alut is going to find her. So I want you to think about why she's not worried about the men, but she's worried about the girl finding her. Why do you think that is? Time, when she was out looking for food, she might wander by the spring and see that it was being used and find my steps leading to the cave. I stood on the rock until the Aleut's fires died. I thought of everything I could do, of the different places I could go, and at last decided to stay in the ravine. The far end of the island had no springs, and if I moved there, I would have no place to hide the canoe, which I might need. I went back to the cave and did not leave until the moon was full. There was little food left. Rontu and I had climbed to the headland, and when we passed the house, I saw that three of the whale ribs had been cut from the fence. No one was there, or else Rontu would have barked. I waited until the tide was low, which was close to dawn, and filled a basket with seawater and abalones. We were back in the cave before it grew light. The seawater kept the abalones fresh, but when we had go to go out again, the night was too dark to find our way to the reef. I therefore had to gather roots. I could never gather many more before the sun rose, so I went out every morning until the next moon came. Then I went to the reef for abalones. During all this time, I saw none of the Aleuts, nor did the girl come near the cave, though I found her footsteps far down the ravine where she had been to dig roots. The Aleuts had not brought their dogs, which was fortunate, for they would have found Rontu's tracks and followed us to the cave. The days were long for Rontu and me. At first he would pace up and down the cave and stand at the opening, sniffing through the cracks. I did not let him out except when I was with him, for fear he would go to the camp and not come back. After a while, he got used to this and would lie all day and watch whatever I was doing. It was dark in the cave, even when the sun was high, so I burned the small fish I had stored. By their light, I began to make a cormorant skirt, working every day on it. The ten skins I had taken at Tall Rock were now dry and in condition to stew, to sew. All of them were from male cormorants, whose feathers are thicker than those of the females, and much glossier. The skirt of yucca fibers was simple to make. I wanted this one to be better, so I cut the skins carefully and sewed them with great care. I made the bottom first, putting the skins end to end and using three of them. For the rest of the skirt, I sewed the others along their sides so that the feathers ran one way on the upper part and a different way along the bottom. It was a beautiful skirt, and I finished it on the day after the second moon. I had burned all of the little fish, and since I could catch no more until the Aleuts left, I took the skirt outside to work on it there. I had found footsteps to the ravine twice again after the first time, but no closer to the cave. I had begun to feel safe, for the winter storms would soon be here, and the Aleuts would leave. Before another moon, they would be gone. I had never seen this skirt in the sunlight. It was black, but underneath were green and gold colors, and all the feathers shimmered as though they were on fire. It was more beautiful than I had thought it would be. I worked fast now. That is, I almost finished, yet from time to time I would stop to hold it against my waist. Rontu, I said, feeling giddy with happiness, if you were not a male dog, I would make you one too, as beautiful as this. Rontu, was so, who was sprawled out at the mouth of the cave, raised his head and yawned at me and went back to sleep. I was standing in the sunlight, holding the skirt to my waist, when Rontu leaped to his feet. I heard the sound of steps. 
It came from the direction of the spring, and as I turned quickly, I saw a girl looking down at me from the brush. My steer sp stood beside the mouth of the cave, within easy reach. The girl was not more than ten paces from me, and with one movement I could have picked up the spear and thrown it. Why I did not throw the spear I do not know, for she was one of the Aleuts who had killed my people on the beach of Crow Cove. She said something, and Rontu left the mouth of the cave and walked slowly toward her. The hair raised on his... So Karana makes this beautiful skirt that she's been working on, and I want you to give me two adjectives, at least, that t describe the skirt. So remember, adjectives are describing words, so give me at least two to describe the skirt that she made. You can give me more if you want to, because I always love more. Nick, but then he walked to where he, she stood and let her touch him. The girl looked at me and made a motion with her hands, which I took to mean that Rontu was hers. No, I cried and shook my head. I picked up my spear. She started to turn and I thought she was going to flee back through the brush. She made another motion, which I took to mean that Rontu was now mine. I did not believe her. I held the spear over my shoulder, ready to throw. To talk, she said, pointing to herself. I did not say my name. I called Rontu and he came back. The girl looked at him and then at me and smiled. She was older than I, but not so tall. She had a broad face and small eyes that were very black. When she smiled, I saw that her teeth were worn down from chewing seal sinew, but they were very white. I was still holding the cormorant skirt, and the girl pointed to it and said something. There was one word, winchcha, which sounded like a word that means pretty in our language. I was so proud of the skirt that I did not think. The spear was in my hand, but I held up the skirt so the sunlight could shine on all of it. The girl jumped down from the ledge and came over to me and touched it. Winchcha, she said again. I did not say the word, but she wanted to hold the skirt, and I gave it to her. She put it against her waist and let it fall from her hips, turning one way and the other. She was graceful, and the skirt flowed around her like water. But I hated the Aleuts, and it took it from her. Winchcha, she said. I had not heard words spoken for so long that they sounded strange to me, yet they were good to hear, even though it was an enemy who spoke them. She said other words I did not understand, but now as she spoke, she looked over my shoulder toward the cave. She pointed to the cave and then to me and made gestures as if she were making a fire. I knew that she wanted me to say, but I did not say it. She wished to know if I lived there in the cave so she could come back with the men and take me to their camp. I shook my head and pointed to the far end of the island, away, away, for I did not trust her. She kept looking toward the cave, but she said nothing more about it. I held the spear, which I could have thrown. I did not, though I feared she would return with the hunters. She came over to me and touched my arm. I did not like the feel of her hand. She said more words and smiled again. Okay, so after Karana meets the Aleut girl, she kind of says two words, right? Not in English. And I want you to kind of predict maybe what they mean. So the first one was to talk. T-U-T-O-K. Not TikTok, but to talk. And in the sentence it says, to talk, she said, pointing to herself. I did not say my name. So what can you assume to talk meant based on that? The other word was winch cha, W-I-N-T-S-C-H-A. And the sentence was, I was still holding the cormorant skirt and the girl pointed to it and said something. There was one word, winch cha, which sounded like a word that means pretty in our language. So based on that sentence, what do you think winch cha means? I'll give you a hint. I said the definition of both of those words as I was reading the sentences. They give you lots of context clues, so you should get this one. And walk to the spring and drink. The next moment she had disappeared in the brush. Rontu did not try to follow her. She made no noise as she went. I crawled back to the cave and began to pack the things I owned. I had all day to do it because the men were working and would not return to the camp before night. By nightfall, I was ready to go. I planned to take my canoe and go to the west part of the island. I could sleep there on the rocks until the loots left, moving from place to place if I needed to. I carried five baskets up the ravine and hid them near my house. It was getting dark and I had to go back to the cave for two that were left. Carefully I crawled through the brush and stopped just above the mouth of the cave and listened. Rontu was behind, beside me and he listened to also. No one could go through the brush in the dusk without making a noise, except someone who had lived in it for a long time. I went past the spring and waited and then onto the cave. I felt that someone had been there while I had been away. 
They could be hiding in the dark watching me. They were waiting until I went into the cave. I was so afraid so I did not go in, but quickly turned around. As I did, I saw something in front of the cave on the flat rock I used for a step. It was a necklace of black stones of a kind I had never seen. So at the end of chapter 21, Karana finds something by the entrance of her cave. What is it that she finds? And also, why might this be considered a cliffhanger? Remember, a cliffhanger is kind of an ending that's abrupt or quick, right? There's no resolution. We don't know what's going to happen really. So why might this, whatever what was by her cave, be considered a cliffhanger? Okay, and we're at the end of chapter 21. So I'm wearing headphones because I'm outside and there's a little bit more background noise. So this is so you can hear me better. Um, I wanted to share with you, I'm wearing a One Direction shirt. I don't know if you know who One Direction is. Some of you might, but they might have a 10 year reunion. And so I wore it in honor of that. So just wanted to share something a little silly, a little fun. And I hope you enjoyed this chapter as much as I did. Um, I really like the parts where they give more detail about the characters how they're feeling. I like that they described Karana's skirt. It was really beautiful sounding. And I really like the encounter or the meeting she had with the Alute girl. I think it was really interesting and not really what I expected. I don't know about you. But I really enjoyed it and I hope you did too. And thank you as always for participating. I'm so proud of you. And I hope you're having an awesome day. And let's keep it up. See you next time.